A reading from the first book of homilies, homily three, salvation by Christ alone. Because all people are sinners and offenders against God and breakers of his law and commandments, therefore no one can by their own acts, works, or deeds, however good they seem, be justified and made righteous before God. Everyone of necessity is constrained to seek for another righteousness or justification to be received from God's own hands, that is to say, the cancellation, pardon, and forgiveness of their sins and trespasses in such things as they have offended. And this justification or righteousness which we receive by God's mercy and Christ's merits embraced by faith is taken, accepted, and accounted by God as our perfect and full justification. In order to understand this more fully, it is our part and duty always to remember the great mercy of God. When all the world was wrapped in sin by breaking of the law, God sent his only Son, our Savior Christ, into this world to fulfill the law for us. By shedding his most precious blood, he made a sacrifice and satisfaction, or as we might say, he made amends to his Father for our sins to satisfy the wrath and indignation he had against us for them. Infants, being baptized and dying in their infancy, are by this sacrifice washed from their sins, brought to God's favor, and made his children and inheritors of his kingdom of heaven. And those who sin after their baptism in act or deed, when they convert and sincerely turn again to God, they are likewise washed by this sacrifice from their sins, in such a way that there remains no spot of sin that shall be imputed to their damnation. This is that justification or righteousness which St. Paul speaks of when he says, No one is justified by the works of the law, but freely by faith in Jesus Christ. And again he says, We believe in Jesus Christ so that we may be justified freely by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because that no one shall be justified by the works of the law. Although this justification is free for us, it does not come so freely to us that there is therefore no ransom paid at all. But here our reasoning may be confused if we reason in this fashion. If a ransom is paid for our redemption, then it is not given to us freely. For a prisoner who paid their ransom is not let go freely. For if they go freely, then they go without ransom. For what else is it to go freely than to be set at liberty without paying a ransom? This argument is answered by the great wisdom of God in this mystery of our redemption. He has so tempered his justice and mercy together that he would neither by his justice condemn us to the everlasting captivity of the devil and his prison of hell, remediless forever without mercy, nor by his mercy deliver us without justice or payment of a just ransom. Rather to his endless mercy, he joined his most upright and equal justice. He has shown us his great mercy in delivering us from our former captivity without requiring any ransom to be paid or amends to be made by us, which it would have been impossible for us to do. And since we did not have it in us to do so, he provided a ransom for us, the most precious body and blood of his own most dear and best beloved son, Jesus Christ, who besides his ransom fulfilled the law for us perfectly. And so the justice of God and his mercy embraced each other and fulfilled the mystery of our redemption. St. Paul speaks of this justice and mercy of God knit together in Romans 3. All have offended and fallen short of the glory of God, but are justified freely by his grace, by the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, whom God has presented to us as a reconciler and peacemaker through faith in his blood to show his righteousness. And in Romans 10, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And in Romans 8, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God himself did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. In these places, the Apostle especially touches three things, which must concur and go together in our justification. On God's part, His great mercy and grace. On Christ's part, justice, that is, 
the satisfaction of God's justice, or the price of our redemption by the offering of his body and shedding of his blood, with fulfilling of the law perfectly and thoroughly, and on our part, true and lively faith in the merits of Jesus Christ, which yet is not ours, but comes by God's working in us. So in our justification we find not only God's mercy and grace, but also his justice, which the Apostle calls the justice of God, and which consists in paying our ransom and fulfilling the law. So the grace of God does not exclude the justice of God in our justification, but only excludes human justice, that is to say, the righteousness of our works, as if they could be meritorious and earn our justification. Therefore, St. Paul declares here nothing on our part concerning our justification, but only a true and lively faith, which nevertheless is the gift of God and not our work alone, without God. And yet that faith does not exclude repentance, hope, love, dread, and the fear of God, to be joined with faith in everyone who is justified. But it does exclude them from the role of justifying, so that although they are all present together in the one who is justified, yet they do not themselves justify us. Nor does faith exclude the righteousness of our good works, which are necessarily to be done afterwards out of duty towards God. For we are very much bound to serve God in doing good deeds, commanded by him in his holy scripture, all the days of our life. But it excludes them in the sense that we may not do them with this intent, to be made good by doing them. For all the good works that we can do are imperfect and therefore not able to deserve our justification. But our justification comes freely by the mere mercy of God and of such great and free mercy that whereas no one in the world was able of themselves to pay any part towards their ransom, it pleased our Heavenly Father of His infinite mercy, without us deserving any of it, to prepare for us the most precious jewels of Christ's body and blood, whereby our ransom might be fully paid, the law fulfilled, and his justice fully satisfied. So that Christ is now the righteousness of all those who truly believe in him. He, for them, paid their ransom by his death. He, for them, fulfilled the law in his life. So that now in him and by him, every true Christian may be called a fulfiller of the law, because that which their infirmity lacked, Christ's justice has supplied. You have heard that everyone should seek for their justification and righteousness from Christ, and how also this righteousness comes to us by Christ's death and merits. You heard also that three things are required to obtain our righteousness, that is, God's mercy, Christ's justice, and a true and living faith, out of which springs good works. Also, it's been declared at length that no one can be justified by their own good works, and that no one fulfills the law according to the full demands of the law. St. Paul in his epistle to the Galatians proved the same, saying, If there had been any law given which could have justified, truly righteousness would have been by the law. And again he says, If righteousness is by the law, then Christ died in vain. And again he says, You who are justified by the law have fallen away from grace. And furthermore, he writes to the Ephesians this way, By grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves, for it is the gift of God and not of works, in case anyone should boast. In short, the sum of all Paul's argument is this, that if justification comes by works, then it does not come by grace, and if it comes by grace, then it does not come by works. And to this end, tend all the prophets, as St. Peter says in Acts 10, all the prophets testify about Christ, that through his name all those who believe in him shall receive the cancellation of sins. In the same way, all the old and ancient authors writing in both Greek and Latin speak about being justified only by this true and living faith in Christ. Of these, I will especially go through three, Hilary, Basil, and Ambrose. St. Hilary says these words plainly in the ninth canon on Matthew, Faith alone justifies. And St. Basil, a Greek author, writes thus, This is a perfect and a whole rejoicing in God, when someone does not advance themselves for their own righteousness, but acknowledges themselves to lack true justice and righteousness, and to be justified by faith alone in Christ. And Paul, he says, glories in the contempt of his own righteousness, and looks for his righteousness from God by faith. 
These are the very words of St. Basil. And St. Ambrose, a Latin author, says these words, This is the obedience of God that those who believe in Christ should be saved without works, by faith only, freely receiving cancellation of their sins. Consider diligently these words, without works, by faith only, freely we receive cancellation of our sins. What can be spoken more plainly than to say that freely without works, by faith only, we obtain cancellation of our sins? These and other similar sentences that we are justified by faith only, freely and without works, we often read in the best and most ancient writers. Besides Hilary, Basil, and St. Ambrose, as mentioned before, we read the same in Origen, St. Chrysostom, St. Cyprian, St. Augustine, Prosper, Ocumenius, Phocius, Bernardus, Anselm, and many other authors, Greek and Latin. Nevertheless, this sentence that we are justified by faith alone is not meant by them in the sense that justifying faith is alone in a person, without true repentance, hope, charity, dread, and the fear of God at any time and season. Nor when they say that we are justified freely do they mean that we should or might afterwards be idle and that nothing should be required on our part afterwards. Neither do they mean that being justified without good works, we should therefore do good works at all, which we shall discuss further later. But this proposition that we are justified only by faith, freely and without works, is spoken to take away clearly all thoughts of our works having merit, since they are unable to deserve our justification at God's hands. It most plainly expresses our weakness and the goodness of God, the great infirmity of ourselves and the might and power of God, the imperfection of our own works and the most abundant grace of our Savior Christ. It therefore wholly ascribes the merit and deserving of our justification to Christ alone and his most precious blood shedding. This faith the Holy Scripture teaches us, this is the strong rock and foundation of Christian religion. All the old and ancient authors of Christ's church do approve this doctrine. This doctrine advances and sets forth the true glory of Christ and beats down the vain glory of mankind. Whoever denies this is not to be counted a true Christian, nor as one who sets forth Christ's glory, but as an adversary to Christ and his gospel and one who advances the vainglory of mankind. So this doctrine is most true, that we are justified freely without any merit of our own good works, as St. Paul expresses it, and freely by this lively and perfect faith in Christ only, as the ancient authors used to put it. Yet this true doctrine must also be truly understood and most plainly declared, in case carnal people should make of it an excuse to live carnally, following the appetite and will of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Because no one should be mistaken by misunderstanding this doctrine, I shall plainly and briefly declare the right understanding of it, so that no one can justly think it is an excuse for carnal liberty to follow the desires of the flesh, or that it encourages any kind of sin to be committed for any ungodly living to be indulged. First, you must understand that in our justification by Christ, our responsibility and God's responsibility are not the same. Justification is not our responsibility, but God's, for we cannot make ourselves righteous by our own works, neither in part nor in whole. For that would be the greatest arrogance and presumption that Antichrist should set up against God, to affirm that someone might, by their own works, take away and purge their own sins, and so justify themselves. But justification is the responsibility of God alone, and is not a thing which we render to him, but which we receive from him. It is nothing we give to him, but which we take from him, by his free mercy, and only by the merits of his most dearly beloved Son, our only Redeemer, Savior, and Justifier, Jesus Christ. So the true understanding of this doctrine that we are justified freely by faith without works or that we are justified by faith in Christ alone is not that our own act to believe in Christ or that our faith in Christ, which is within us, is what justifies us and earns our justification for us. For that would be to account ourselves justified by some act or virtue that is within ourselves. But the true understanding and meaning of it is that although we hear God's word and believe it, although we have faith, 
hope, charity, repentance, dread, and fear of God within us, and do, however, many good works, yet we must renounce the merit of all our said virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and all other virtues and good deeds, which we either have done, shall do, or can do, as things that are far too weak and insufficient and imperfect to deserve cancellation of our sins and our justification. Therefore, we must trust only in God's mercy and that sacrifice which our High Priest and Savior, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, once offered for us upon the cross. By this we obtain God's grace and the forgiveness both of our original sin in baptism as well as all actual sin committed by us after our baptism, if we truly repent and turn sincerely to him again. In this matter of forgiveness for sin, St. John the Baptist, although he was a very virtuous and godly man, pointed the people away from himself and pointed them to Christ, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the same way, as great and as godly a virtue as living faith is, yet it points us away from itself and sends or points us to Christ, that only by him may we have cancellation of our sins or justification, so that our faith in Christ says to us, as it were, thus, It is not I that take away your sins, but it is Christ only, and to him alone I send you for that purpose. Renouncing all your good virtues, words, thoughts, and works, and only putting your trust in Christ. It has been manifestly declared to you that no one can fulfill the law of God, and therefore by the law all are condemned. It therefore follows necessarily that some other thing should be required for our salvation than the law, and that is a true and a living faith in Christ, bringing forth good works and a life according to God's commandments. And you have also heard the ancient author's opinion of this saying, Faith in Christ alone justifies a person, so plainly declared. So you see that the very true meaning of this proposition or saying we are justified only by faith in Christ, according to the meaning of the old ancient authors, is this. We put our faith in Christ, that we are justified by him alone, that we are justified by God's free mercy and the merits of our Savior Christ alone. By no virtue or good works of our own that are in us, or that we are able to have or to do, can we deserve the same. Christ himself is the only meritorious cause of our justification.